Okay, good evening, everybody. We're going to get started, if everybody can uh, take a seat. Thank you all for coming. My name is Adam Chapdelaine. I'm the town manager here in Arlington. So I'm going to provide just a brief welcome, uh, an introduction, and just set a little bit of context for why we're all here tonight. Um, so welcome. Thank you for coming. Um, you're, you're here for BRT, Bus Rapid Transit. If that's not what you're here for, this is the, uh, this is the wrong meeting. Um, and I want to int uh, briefly introduce, we have uh, a member of the Board of Selectmen, Joe Kiro, here uh, tonight as well to listen uh, to both the presentations and what folks here uh, tonight have to say. So in terms of the why are we here, I would say the overarching why, uh, beyond just bus rapid transit or BRT, as we'll be referring to it as, we're here because the leadership of the town, from the Board of Selectmen to the town manager's office, to the Planning and Community Development Department, to the Department of Public Works, we understand the nexus between transportation and quality of life. Whether that's transportation getting to work, home from work, meetings during the day, weekend activities, transportation is a central piece of all of our quality of life living here in the Arlington community and as a part of the greater Boston region. More specifically, about a year ago, we saw an opportunity being advertised by the Bar Foundation to be able to consider bus rapid transit, again, or BRT, um, to pilot a program to see if we could improve bus service here in Arlington. So uh, it was last May, we took a look at that, saw an opportunity that the uh, 77 bus and also the 79 and the 350 along the Massachusetts Avenue corridor might provide an exciting opportunity to improve bus service for people who live in Arlington or come and go uh, through Arlington uh, to implement elements of bus rapid transit. So we submitted uh, a letter of interest. The Bar Foundation responded saying that they were interested in our, um, in our submission. We then drafted an application approved by the Board of Selectmen, which was submitted to the Bar Foundation, had an interview with representatives of the Bar Foundation, and were awarded this grant for BRT. And what this grant is funding is this public process that we're really kicking off tonight it's funding the design and engineering of some alternatives or proposals for the implementation of a pilot study or a pilot, um, pilot effort for BRT. And, and then it will also fund us studying the success of that and determining whether or not we want to make any of the things that were implemented via the pilot permanent. So that's, <clears throat> that's the why we're here. Uh, so tonight, and you're going to hear this uh, repeated several times, we're not here to demonstrate or show any proposals or designs that have already been prepared. We're here tonight to talk about what BRT is, what the different attributes of BRT are and how they work, how it's worked in other parts of the state, country, and the world, and then talk about the process going forward of how we're going to design uh, options for further consideration, review, and public comment. And then probably most importantly, we want to hear questions from you, comments from you, and feedback from you as we go into this design phase, uh, phase so that when we come back here, I believe in August, uh, we'll be able to propose things to you that have taken your comments and feedback into account. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Raitt, the Director of Planning and Community Development, to give a more detailed overview of our schedule going forward and what we're going to learn tonight. So thank you all for coming. Good evening. <laughs> I'm Jenny Reid. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. Thank you, Adam. Um, and I just want to also recognize two of my staff who are here, Aaron Zwerko, who's the Assistant Director, and Ali Carter, who's the Economic Development Coordinator, who uh, did a lot of work to help uh, organize and prepare for this forum tonight, so thank you. Um, my goal for this evening is really to, one, walk you through the agenda for what to expect, um, and then two, I'm going to talk about the scope of work, and then lastly, I'm going to talk a little bit about the timeline and what you can expect in terms of how you can engage in this process, um, what's going to be next in the process, and um, all the ways that actually you can get involved, which doesn't just include coming to these meetings at Town Hall. Um, so with that, you already heard about the introductions um, and the welcome. Everybody's here. We're actually going to do successive introductions, so I'm not going to give a bio of everybody who's up here, probably lucky for you. 
Um, I'm sure it's lengthy. Everybody's a, a wonderful expert in their field, and I'm very excited that they're here this evening. They've been incredibly supportive during this process. It's really a team effort to make this happen here, and part of that team is all of you in the room. Um, so with that, uh, really we're going to learn more, as Adam said already actually, uh, what's BRT? What are we talking about? I think um, there's been a lot of messages out there so far, either published or online or in other places, where there's a lot of uh, mixed communication about what bus rapid transit is and what it looks like and what it could mean for Arlington. So we want to get that out there tonight, what exactly we're talking about, what it has looked like, um, and give you some examples to think about. There's also some examples actually in the back of the room on the table. Um, Julia is going to actually walk through a lot of those examples and what they've looked like in other places. Uh, then we're going to learn a little bit more about um, from, from Ralph, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about the measurements and the, the sort of evaluation process, which I think will introduce you to some of the things that we might, that might be transferable to what we're going to do here in Arlington. Then we'll hear from Wes uh, from the MBTA, who will be talking with us about TSP, Transit Signal Priority, which is going to be a key feature in what we're planning to test here in Arlington. So what we're planning to do also is hold all of the Q&A till the end, but we'll see how that feels in terms of just moving through all of the presentations. There's a lot of volume, a lot to learn about. So if we need to pause at any moment, I'm happy to do that, but I might have to reorganize the room a little bit because what I'd like you to do is cue at a mic um, to ask your questions, and I'm going to be moderating that. Um, so we'll have enough time for Q&A. We'll do a wrap-up. And uh, with that, anybody have any questions about why you're here tonight, what we're doing? Who am I? None of the above? <laughs> Good. Okay. So um, you learned a little bit from Adam about why we, why we are investing this time in this project and why we want to move forward with it, why we think it's a good idea um, the, in, as part of the master plan process in other planning processes that have been identified by the Transportation Advisory Committee and others in town. It's really important to look at mo multimodal opportunities in town. And this provides us with an opportunity to look at some interventions that will help improve traffic flow in key places in town, particularly along the Mass Ave corridor. It could be something that we also eventually decide to investigate on other uh, bus corridors. That's a possibility. But we wanted to test this because, and you'll learn about it more, there's a real opportunity to reduce congestion along this part of the corridor, and that's causing a problem right now. Um, and also to uh, increase reliability, which is a, is a longer story, and that relates directly to the MBTA. Wes will talk a little bit about that. Uh, so the, with, the, with the pilot, it is a one-month uh, pilot that would be held during the morning commute. The exact times are to be determined. We have a sense that it might be somewhere between 6 a.m. and 10 a.m., uh, but that's part of what we're going to be studying. We've hired a consulting firm, VHB, who has done a lot of different transportation and traffic work throughout the state, throughout the country, actually, and I think globally, um, where they're going to be providing us with engineering assistance to help us develop what are basically scenarios that we're going to investigate to figure out what exactly the pilot will look like here, the pilot that we will ultimately implement in the fall. It's not a construction-oriented situation, so there won't be any physical changes to the roadway when we're doing this pilot. It will be things like cones, um, signal changes, signage, a lot of education and outreach, and then followed up by enforcement. This effort, while um, Adam had mentioned my Department of Planning and Community Development, is also in collaboration with the Department of Public Works and the Arlington Police Department. So it's meant to be a multi-department uh, effort, particularly um, you won't see me out there enforcing buses, just so you know. Um, I don't plan to do that. Uh, that's where the police department comes in, into play. So uh, the proposed features, what are we talking about here? We're talking about basically four things that we're going to be investigating. The first one is the possibility of a dedicated bus lane. What could that look like? Uh, the evaluation will be from Lake Street to the Alewife Brook Parkway. And you'll learn a little bit more about that as to why we chose that section of the roadway when you hear from Wes. Um, Mass Ave on, along uh, from Mystic Street actually to the parkway, we're going to evaluate something called signal prioritization. Um, and that, again, is going to be t discussed a little bit further in a moment. Uh, Q jump lanes, which basically is a, is a, a way to get uh, buses, give buses a head start um, and evaluating that 
possibility at 15 different intersections along Mass Ave. And then potentially some bus stop relocation and consolidation, which based on their use, based upon uh, sort of utilization of the bus, bus stops, um, traffic and transportation demand in those different areas, we'll evaluate those opportunities from Lake Street uh, again to the parkway. So what is the timeline for this effort? Uh, it's actually quite a while, <laughs> in, in my opinion, and uh, with a lot of opportunity for further engagement, um, but with some key moments in time where there will be these bigger forums and opportunities to engage. So uh, we started this process, as, as Adam noted, last year. Um, it's been a while in terms of the internal discussion and dialogue, but has only been coming into, into the forefront publicly I, I would say pretty recently. So with that, um, when we hired VHB, that's really where we got the kicked into higher gear this whole entire timeline, which means that from April till June, there really is gonna be the field work and analysis that we need to do in order to really figure out uh, the whole scope of this project, which includes data collection, a real analysis about parking, roadway utilization, uh, traffic flow, peak demand, all kinds of different things. And also, of course, most importantly, meeting with stakeholders, business community, residents, people who live along that, those different sections of the roadway. You're obviously here tonight at our educational forum. It is meant to be that. It's meant to be educational for you to learn a little bit more about BRT and obviously a little bit about this project. Um, from June to August is when we're gonna be doing those scenario development. Um, and that actually will develop into two ultimate scenarios. Along the way, we're gonna have regular meetings in East Arlington with a group of stakeholders um, some, at a place to be determined. And that's happening actually from May through October, through the time that we launched the, pilot, the actual pilot. Um, August and September is when we're gonna study this sort of implementation, what the final design will be, and prepare for implementation. We'll have some engagement. We're gonna have something called a street team, which sounds kind of exciting, if you think that's exciting. We're looking for volunteers to help with the street team. <laughs> um, and then we're gonna have the Alternative Scenarios Forum actually August 15th, uh, Wednesday night in summer. And that'll give you an opportunity to see what, after all of the meetings with stakeholders, we will have been able to figure out in terms of those two scenarios that I mentioned earlier. The pilot would run, we think, in October for the whole month, and then we want to evaluate it. We want to figure out what did we learn, what do we need to do differently, is this possible here, what are the possible metrics for moving forward if we want to do this, um, or do we scrap it entirely and look at a different roadway altogether. Um, and that would then mean that we'll have a tentative date for a final forum in November, where we present to you what we learned, hear a little bit more and get some more feedback from you about what you think we could do a little bit differently, and then we'll wrap it up. So with that, um, I'm actually gonna turn it over to Julia, who's gonna tell us, you're gonna learn a lot about BRT, how it's been working all around the world, and uh, with that, Julia Wallers. Thanks, Jenny. Let's see. I don't think this is actually... Oh, it's not working? I'm totally a clicker person, so I just need to make sure if not, I can hover by the laptop. That's okay. Okay. So, hi everyone. I am Julia Wallers, and I am here to inspire you on the bigger picture of what BRT is, emphasizing that this is not what we are doing here in Arlington, and we are not some outside group coming in to force something down your throat that we see in other countries that's really massive and amazing, but maybe sort of intimidating and not quite for the scale of, of your roads. So just want to put that out there from, from the get-go, but rather to give you some context of what is, the, what is the bigger picture of what we're looking at. What are we testing? Understanding that BRT isn't something that you can just sort of pilot for a month, but what would happen if we implemented even just a few of the features? You know, how would that benefit quality of life, 
address transportation challenges, what have you. So anyway, I am with um, an organization called the Institute for Transportation and Development Policy, ITDP, and we are our, actually a global nonprofit um, based all around the world. Our home office is in New York. You will see that Boston is not on this map. Um, that's because the Boston office is just right here. You're, you're looking at it. Um, and we are part of this project team helping out Arlington and a few of the other cities around the region that are, that are testing out these features of bus rapid transit. So ITDP, basically, what we do in the US and around the world is look at problems like this. This is, this is obviously not a, a, an American city. I think this is Nairobi. But this is a familiar scenario. Maybe Mass Ave looks a little something like this in the morning. I don't know. But we take a look at situations like that and ask ourselves, how can we use our road space more efficiently? What would happen, so with a three-lane road, you can fit you know, about 3,000 people. What if you add you know, an elevated roadway, which God forbid, that's certainly not going to be a solution here. I think we're sort of past the days of building elevated. We're sort of more in the era, era of taking them down. But so try, say you do that, all right, you, you add a few more people, 4,700, but what if we did dedicated lanes for bus rapid transit? Whammo, suddenly you are really using your roadway in, at a whole different level of efficiency. So why buses for Boston, just to zero in on our own uh, city here, we know that our region is growing significantly economically. At the same time, regional traffic is increasing a lot. We know that, and we've all felt it. At the same time, we know that public transit is a very efficient way to capture, serve that growth in a sustainable way, reduce congestion, and relieve the demand for parking. We can't forget about parking is directly tied to how many cars are on the road going each trip at, on either end. Um, so long-range uh, planning guides tell us that we've seen actually a 30% increase in transit, that we will see a 30% increase in transit, and we know that as much as we love trains, we love the T, buses are actually the easiest way to expand local service, um, but at the same time, our bus system suffers from a lot of drawbacks, uh, significant delay, reliability challenges, comfort issues, problems at the station, you name it. So we've got some real challenges to address if we're really going to take advantage of what buses have to offer us. So buses actually, this is, and this is kind of surprising, but around the world in most major cities, buses carry way more people than rail. Even in London, which is sort of known for the tube, you actually have more passengers every day on the bus. So this is sort of an under, under, underrated form of, tran of public transit. So we talked about road space. What about money? Everything comes with a price tag. So let's say we have a billion dollars to spend on our, solving our traffic problem. What can we build with a billion dollars? Well, you know, it gets you about nine kilometers of metro. Sorry, these are, these are European terms. That, um, nine miles of that, no, sorry, nine kilometers. If you want to do light rail, that's a little more expensive above ground, 22 kilometers. But BRT, suddenly 86 kilometers. So we see this mode as not just efficient um, time-wise, but also financially. So here's just a small case, uh, Dar Salaam, this is actually the winner of ITDP's Global Sustainability Award this year for their gold standard BRT system. They, had a big tra they have a big traffic problem. And by implementing their BRT system, uh, after phase one, we had 8% of residents near rapid transit. And just after, um, one th after the fourth phase, 33% of residents were now near rapid transit just by the expansion of their BRT system. So bus rapid transit, this is not a household name in the US, not yet, BRT. Um, basically high capacity, high speed, it's customer oriented, and it is so much more than an old bus running in a bus lane. Mind you, if we do a dedicated lane here in Arlington, that's exactly what it's going to be, an old bus running in a dedicated lane. But we're not doing BRT, we're just testing out elements of it. How can we make our bus run a little better? Give it a priority, make that bus a little sexier by giving it its own lane. So bus rapid transit is also not, it's not just for those with low income, it's really for everybody. So we're trying to capture the needs of everybody in the community. It's not a last resort. It's not like, oh, if I don't have any other way, maybe I'll take the bus. But actually, I want to take the bus because it's so fast, it's so on time, it gets me where I need to be. BRT basics are some very standard features of what what is included in, in true bus rapid transit. So the, really the first and most important thing that defines bus rapid transit is a dedicated right-of-way. A bus not 
stuck in traffic. That's number one. Uh, busway alignment, we have you people platform level boarding, so you're not taking that big step onto the bus, which is a huge barrier for a lot of people. It also takes a lot of time. Offboard fare collection, no shoving money as you're getting on, and intersection treatments. Um, I'll walk you through this a little bit. This bottom picture here is Transmillennio in Colombia. So the dedicated but right away, as you'll see, Ideally, we have the bus running down the middle of the street so we don't conflict with the right turn in vehicles. A true BRT does run down the median, but the most important thing is get the bus out of traffic. And I want to emphasize that this doesn't just make bus drivers and bus riders happy, it makes car drivers happy. Because what's one of the most annoying things when you're trying to drive down the street in the morning, the bus is constantly going in and out, in and out. It causes traffic, it causes frustration on both ends. So that's something that we see all around the world. So dedicated lanes are very critical to the speed and capacity of true BRT. Busway alignment, um, like I said, usually running down the middle of the lane to avoid that conflict with the right turning vehicles. So not, not on the right but we don't always have the capacity to do that. It depends on what kind of space you have in your road, case by case basis. Platform level boarding. We won't be doing this here in Arlington. Um, one of our other pilots, Everett, actually is doing this. They already have a dedicated lane on Broadway, so with their grant, the same grant that you've received here in Arlington, they are actually purchasing to uh, platforms so that people can board at the level of the bus. This offers enormous benefits for people with mobility challenges, people with strollers, um, wheelchairs, walkers, um, and so we're very excited about that element of it. It also speeds up the time to board the bus a lot. Stations are a very big part of uh, bus rapid transit, and this is if you were to build out a full BRT corridor where you put a lot of time and energy into the design of the stations, making them welcoming, accessible places. It's kind of like, I hate to say like a bus that runs like a subway, but that's the best way to sort of conceptualize what this is. You know, vendors, pedestrian crossing, lighting, heating, the nines. Off-board fare collection, huge way to speed up boarding. Um, so you will have actually paid for your ticket before you get on the bus. Uh, fortunately, here in, in Boston, we're on our way to that with the development of AFC 2.0, the next automated fare collection system for the T. No more Charlie cards. You will just use your phone, tap right on. So we do have that coming, and that certainly lends itself to, speed, to speeding up um, bus service and, and giving more priority. The fifth thing, intersection treatments. Um, Jenny mentioned a few of the, these things, queue jump lanes, allowing the bus to sort of jump ahead at the intersection. Transit signal priority, with which Wes will tell you more about, that the, the signal knows that the bus is coming. Hey, I'll stay green a little longer for the bus. So you prioritize that bus. Speed up, prioritize, reward those people who are in the bus, move traffic along. So here's your summary, all the things sort of, you know, when Bar Foundation sort of put out this grant, who wants to try who wants to try BRT? Sort of here's your menu of things that you could test out. And Arlington is going to try any number of these things. We don't know what they're going to be yet. We do know it won't be pl platform level boarding. That's a whole different level. What's that? Or an elevated realm? <laughs> no, 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 but that's not on the BRT. No, 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 sorry. <laughs> um, one thing I, I would be remiss if I did not mention the crucial importance of passenger access, great pedestrian and bicycle facilities um, le um, leading to the BRT system. That's actually central to that. Another thing here, and don't freak out, this is not going to happen to you in Arlington, but compact transit-oriented development. Land use is key to transit, having residential and commercial density. So you have a lot of people, a lot of streets that are serving the corridor. In, in your full-scale gold standard BRT corridors around the world, you see something like this, a corridor with high density right along that main road where the BRT serves, feeder routes, and then um, you know, neighborhoods sort of spreading out from there. The BRT standard is a guide that ITDB developed, and gold standard is what you might sort of hear. It's really the ultimate in bus service, gold standard. A lot of, a lot of you might familiar, be familiar with the lead, um, develop, lead for green buildings, had a sort of you know, gold, silver, bronze. That's, we also have that for BRT, which is a kind of exciting way to put a, a stamp on it and a brand so that we can't just sort of say, oh, you know, the silver line, it's, it's BRT. And, well, no, actually, there's like some very particular things 
things for a system to embody. To be called BRT, um, gold standard is the ultimate, and which the Bar Foundation would love to see embraced somewhere in Boston someday. So BRT is actually not just a global phenomenon. It is taking shape in the United States. Um, these, these are just a few examples. Um, the closest one being Hartford, CT Fast Track. This is not gold standard BRT, but um, and actually I'm not sure what level. I want to say it's bronze, but it serves in thousands of people a day, runs in its own dedicated lane. Um, it has been a great service to that city. Even in Los Angeles, which gets such a bad rap for not being a transit-friendly city, they have a great BRT system that serves a lot of people very efficiently. You see their stations, bus runs in its own lane, I believe, um, for the entire trip. Um, Cleveland, Ohio's Health Connector is one of the most famous and oldest BRT systems in the United States. Um, I, there, there are a few other ones. We were hoping maybe Boston could be the first in the nation to go gold standard, but I'm sorry to say that Albuquerque, New Mexico has beat us to the punch. Uh, Route 66 now has a gold standard BRT corridor up and running with electric buses. But that's Albuquerque and this is Boston, two totally different cities, so we could still put our own spin on that. So the pilots, so zeroing this in on what we're doing here, um, Jenny told you about Arlington. As part of this grant program, um, we, the Bar Foundation also selected Everett and Cambridge and Watertown. As you might have, some of you have maybe heard of something like this going on on Mount Auburn Street. That's the Cambridge Watertown pilot, and then Everett has their pilot um, on Broadway. So this is all part of a broader initiative called Boston BRT. I'm just going to run through this because Jenny already told you what sort of how we got to this place and how Arlington was selected because you have this corridor with high ridership and potential to prioritize the bus and sort of showcase the great results of doing something like that. So just to map it up, we have our, our three pilots. These, these are just the pilots being funded by the Bar Foundation. There have been other pilots because this type of momentum is catching on. Some of us would even say this is the year of the bus. Okay, it's, it's catching on. So we have Arlington here over in Everett. Um, they have their pilot, and then Cambridge and Watertown are actually working together on a pilot on Mott Auburn Street. And it was, it's kind of cool. Ralph will tell you a little bit more about this, but how we looked at selecting these, these pilots was based on ridership, and on some of them, for example, um, on a modern state, at any given time during the peak commute, there are actually more people on the bus than that are driving. So if you're trying to prioritize buses, attack congestion, we should prioritize the people that are in those, in those buses. That's a lot, a lot of people. So each one of these projects has a consultant team, technical support team, which includes myself and my team in New York City, um, Stantec, Ralph Donisco, who's here tonight. We're both helping with technical assistance, sort of providing outside um, guidance. We have a great marketing and communications team from Denter Line, as well as graphic design. So it's not just Arlington doing this all by itself, by themselves. Uh, we work together as, as a partnership, as well as with the T, and having the T on board has been crucial and is innovative in itself, just having municipal and the MBTA sitting down together talking about creative strategies. That's not something that historically happens every day. So like I said, bus priority pilots are on the rise, not just in the world, but in Boston. Um, who's heard about the, the Rosendale pilot going on right now? Awesome. Okay, it's really in the news. We have a lot of press. Um, so this is the second time that they did this once in December, and now for the whole month of May, uh, Washington Street has a dedicated lane in the morning. Um, connecting thousands of people to Forest Hill Station. It's been great. Really, the only thing the city is trying to figure out is sort of how can we do this without allocating too many resources on enforcement. And luckily, we have a city like Everett, who already is over a year into theirs. Um, they first piloted their dedicated lane here on Broadway using cones. Almost overnight, it was just a very a strong political will. They knew they had more people on the bus in peak time than in driving, so they wanted to give the bus its own lane. Use the parking lane from 4 a.m. to 9 a.m., and by now, and they also have it paint with paint, but um, today that bus runs every morning and, and there's not a lot of enforcement drivers. Everyone just kind of understands the new um, way of the road. Somerville did a pilot on Prospect Street, and now we hear that cities like Malden and Medford are wanting to get on board. So this is, is exactly what we hoped would happen in putting out this RFP for these grants, that it would sort of spark every city to start thinking, hey, what can I do with my buses? How can we reallocate our road space and, and get more people on the bus, give a better experience for those people who still need to drive because we have traffic flowing more, um, more swiftly, which, which is the goal for everybody. So 
how are we going to know if we're doing a good job? That's the important part. I know you all have those questions, and I have a super expert here to answer those questions. And how are we going to know what those lessons are from this pilot? That's the fun part of a pilot. You get to test things out, what works, what doesn't work. Ralph Danisco, senior planner. Um, sorry, planner? Yes. With, with Stantec. And I'll hand it over to Ralph. Thank you, Julia. So, I'm, I'm, as Julia mentioned, my name is Ralph Tanisco. I'm part of the Bar Foundation team that's helping the municipalities implement their pilots. And my particular focus is offering technical assistance both on the design and the planning aspects, and then also how we measure success. And a big part of measuring success is understanding what are the problems, right? What are the problems today? And they're going to differ for all of the quarters. I swear I did not plan this, but thank you, Wes, for planning it for me. As I was finalizing my slides for this morning, I went on and looked at the Route 77, and right on the MBTA's website, just this morning, delayed 20 to 25 minutes due to traffic. Right? This is exactly the kind of thing that the pilots are meant to start addressing. So we're trying to help understand exactly what this looks like and feels like in all the different municipalities. So. We're going to measure a lot of things. I'm going to talk through. I'll try not to be too technical. But here, I just want to give a little bit more of an overview of what's already happening on Mass Ave and the buses that serve it. So you see here, this is just a map showing the frequency, just to orient you. Here's Mass Ave down through Alewife Brook Parkway. Um, the 79 and the 350 continue to Alewife. The 77 goes to Harvard Square. I think I have that right. <laughs> yeah. right? And one of the things we want to look at is combined frequency. So that, what I have on the right here is just peak and it has the number of minutes. That means for the 77, a bus comes every eight minutes. Scheduled, that's the way the MBTA is trying to operate it. And then also the other routes, you combine them all and in each direction during the peak, you're getting 13 to 14 buses an hour. That's a, less than a bus every five minutes. In transit world, that's really good, reliable, that's really good service. I don't want to say it's reliable yet. Right, but it's frequent service. You can count on it. You don't have to necessarily consult the schedule. You know that a bus is gonna come, theoretically, you know, every four to five minutes. And those buses serve this many riders a day. The 77, guess what? It's the most frequent route, so it has the highest ridership. Um, but you combine the three routes and you've got over 10,000 people a day that are riding just these three routes you know, in Arlington and Cambridge and you know, the, the few other towns that they connect to. But the service is not running reliably, right? This is just you know one day in May, the last week, and the past 30 days. And what that's showing you is that you know rarely are you getting 100% on time performance, or 90%, or even 80%. You know you're in the 60s and 70s, and there's a lot of factors for why that's happening. You know the whole idea of bus rapid transit is actually to start addressing all of these things. So not only do you get a bus every eight minutes, but you actually get a bus every eight minutes, not no bus for 15 and then three buses at one time, right? And we'll talk a little about that. And these are the sorts of things we want to help design into the process and we want to measure if we're effective by achieving you know, much higher reliabilities here. And then just got some maps that show ridership by stop along the whole corridor. And part of the reason we want to show these is that the benefits anywhere we're doing an individual improvement, you're not just benefiting the stuff that happens on that block, you're benefiting the riders from way back. So even if you live further away or even in the next town over, any of those physical improvements or signal priority like Wes is gonna talk about, benefiting a whole series of people. What this map is actually showing is, a fancy term is load factor, but it's how many people are on the bus. And if you picture, if you, how many people here ride the bus in the morning or in the afternoon, right? So even if you get on at the beginning, it's the bus gets more and more full, you know, for many of these routes, and then they, they dump out at, at Alewife or Harvard Square or maybe somewhere closer to the end. So any improvements that accrue are going to accrue to all of the people that are on the bus at that time, right? And they come from fairly far back. And Actually, looked. the T has been fantastic at putting online a lot of information from some of their recent surveys, and we look at kind of who the riders are, and this is just some information about the folks that are on these three particular routes. 
you know, more than half are commuters, people that, you know, self-identified as commuters, but surprisingly on the Route 77, 56% of the riders are not commuters. So they're people that are going to school or going about their daily business or trying to live their lives in Arlington and Cambridge. And it's not just, can we fix something for a 20 minute window when everybody's trying to get through there, but can we make it better for all the people that are using this over the course of the day? Interestingly, 97% of the riders on the 77 and the 79 walk or bike to the stop. That's how they're getting to the service. So these are your friends and neighbors, right? These are literally the people that you see every day that are benefiting from this, whether it's you or not, right? And, you know, a third of them are low income, and that's, that's important, but surprisingly, two-thirds of the people that are riding these buses have access to a vehicle. So many of them are riding by choice, and I'm sure would, more would ride by choice if the service was even better and more reliable. So these are things we're gonna look at too as we move on through this process. Couple of pieces here. So when all the improvements that we would make, we would try to look at two things primarily in terms of how the service is run. One is the reliability, and two is the travel time. Can we get through a section faster, and can we do that consistently? What this is showing here is, you know, the MBTA actually schedules buses to take longer at certain times of day due to traffic and volume and all the other factors that, you know, go into running the bus. So during the AM peak, the MBTA, you know, this is just linked to the Route 77, assumes that that bus is going to take five extra minutes. That means they have to dedicate more resources to it in order to achieve those eight minute frequency, those eight minute headways. If you can shave that down, we can save resources or we can reinvest those resources, right? That's, that's one of the things that a pilot tries to test. And then we look, that's for the whole route, you know, just within the piloted area, just within the area we're looking at making specific improvements, you can actually break down what they schedule for each of those times, right? However, that's the schedule. Just in the schedule, they're looking to, they know that there are some differences. We showed you the reliability numbers before, we're rarely able to achieve those scheduled results. 50th percentile numbers, you know, most of the time, you're three to five minutes behind that schedule along the whole route. We'll actually be able to drill down and measure it in the areas where we're making physical improvements and understand what, what that looks like. The 90th percentile, which is sort of, you know, kind of the normally bad version <laughs> of how things work, you're operating 10 to 20 minutes behind schedule like today, like we saw on the, on the MBTA's website. So again, these are things we're gonna try to measure and capture, and we will think that this pilot has been a success if we can really improve what those look like. And that travel time variance, that traffic you know, impacts on the route, it causes all the things that frustrate you as bus riders. It causes long waits, it causes overcrowding because it took longer for the bus to come so there was more people at the stop and then the bus got even more full. And then the bus behind it starts catching up to it and that's how you get bus bunching, right? And the bus bunching is just when you get two or three buses that come in a row even though you've been waiting for 15 or 20 minutes. So that's the kind of thing you see out there and really frustrates riders. It frustrates the operators too, which is why we wanna make these physical improvements. We're also gonna measure perception um, Jenny mentioned the street teams. I don't know where she went, but she mentioned the street teams. There she is back there. That's one of the things they'll do is they'll go out and talk to people. Did you ride the bus? Did you used to ride the bus? Does this feel better? Does it feel faster? How? One of the things we've been working on with the Bar Foundation is on the previous pilots. You've actually seen there's been a marked improvement in service. There's been an even greater improvement in the perception of that service. And it's that perception that's also going to get more people to ride the service. So these are things that we're going to look at. And also look at, you know, not just the people we talk to, but the kind of web traffic and social media. And we've got a great team that's monitoring all this stuff. So how much are people liking this? What are they liking? What are they frustrated with? And the beauty of a pilot is we can try to address the things that are frustrating people and do more of the things that people like. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Wes Edwards. Let me see if I can get your title right. Director of Operations Outreach. Operations Planning, Operations Planning Outreach. Thank you. Thank you,
Thank you, Ralph. Um, so I'm Wes Edwards. I'm the Director of Operations, Planning, and Outreach for the MBTA. I've been with the MBTA since about de since literally December 13th of uh, last year. I came from Seattle, Washington, where I worked for King County Metro, which is the big transit agency out in Seattle, Washington. Um, uh, they brought me on at the T because I had a lot of experience working with cities for King County Metro. And a lot of what I did was really figure out how can we make buses run faster and run more efficiently, make them reliable. And a lot of it is how do well do we work with our own cities and how much are our own cities willing to help support the transit system. So I came back east. I have family. My wife's family is all from this area. So I was happy to move back here. We're living with my in-laws right now, which is great and horrible all at the same time. <laughs> But I'm happy to be here, and I think the MBTA has some really great opportunities, especially with working with a lot of our jurisdictions in the greater Boston area. So I'm here to talk about transit signal priority. So I want to take a moment too, and I think Julia tried to do this too, but I want to just ground us a little bit in what, 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 how we move around our city streets. So what you see here is a picture of what it takes to move 40 people in cars, 40 people walking, 40 people on bike, and fill a bus with 40 people. So, as many of you know, probably driving down Mass Ave at 8.30 in the morning, it starts to look like you have that many cars on the street. And if I was driving down Mass Ave at 8.30 in the morning and I got stuck in that, I knew I was going to have a bad morning. But you can also move the same amount of people walking with much less space, biking a little bit more, and you can also fit all those people onto a bus. So why am I telling you this? As many of you know, Arlington, the greater Boston area, all your neighbor cities, they have a lot, they're having growth in population right now. Your congestion's getting worse. So Mass Ave isn't gonna get any wider. So we have to think about how we actually move more people through your own town, Arlington, in the future without widening your roads. So start to think about, are we gonna use buses? Are we gonna use bikes? Are we gonna walk? Are we gonna keep having more and more cars, which really does require making roadway bigger? But also, how do we balance all of these? We're not gonna say one of these is the solution, it's the silver bullet to solve anything, but we need to balance all of this. And how do we do that? And how does the town work with the MBTA? And how do we prioritize the different ways that we move down your city streets? So this all involves working with cities, developing partnerships. Um, as many of you know, so sorry, I thought I heard your question. Um, as many of you know, um, our subways, our commuter rail for the MBTA, we own the tracks that those drive on. We own the land under those tracks. We maintain all of that. Buses are a totally different ballgame. Our buses run on your city streets. You, you own the streets that our buses really operate on. What we can help with is we own the buses. We help manage uh, stop placement. We have guidelines for how you place stops. We help manage the schedule. We help manage the fares. But you guys have the streets, you guys have the curbs, you guys do curb management, you guys have the sidewalk space, the intersections, and you guys do enforcement of your streets. All of those are really important to having a good, fast, and reliable bus system. So for us, we're starting to engage in a partnership process with our cities. It's really talking with the cities and just opening channels of communication so we can inform and engage each other. And then it's starting to understand what projects that cities have in the pipeline, what projects the MBTA has in the pipeline, and where we can find um, opportunities to connect, and then once it's connecting, then we can start discussing issues and trade-offs and then decide if we want to move a project forward, and then we can try and figure out paths to take action. Today is a good example. I think working with Arlington, the Bar Foundation, um, and uh, ITDP is just one of these great opportunities that we're all trying to connect, we're all, we're all discussing the issues, the trade-offs, and figure out if, if there's a path forward and how we can take action. So partnerships, what do partnerships look like? There's a lot of different examples out there, so I'm just gonna kind of run through a few. So bus operations tools, things like, can we relocate stops to make our buses get in and out of a curb faster? Can we have less stops in a corridor? The less times a bus stops, the faster it'll go. Can we change our route design so it might not, say, snake into a neighborhood where it takes a long time? Can we just keep it on the main road and make people walk just a little bit further? Infrastructure tools. This is basically any time you pour concrete or put up a sign. Can you pour concrete in a way that it helps a bus? For example, the easiest one I always explain to people is if you have a bus and it has to take a really sharp corner, is there a way you can work with the city to say, you know what, we, next time when you pour concrete for that corner, can you just pull it back a little bit so the bus doesn't have to make this really hard and difficult turn? That's a simple thing, but actually, if you're talking with a city who's already going through a process of redoing an intersection, it makes a huge difference for our drivers. Traffic control tools, uh, talk, I'm gonna talk about signal priority, transit signal priority in a second, but also lane restriction and exemptions, it's sort of how you manage vehicles and buses in the lanes of traffic. 
and Q jumps. Q jumps is a unique one that we've talked about for a number of times. It's, uh, it's where you actually use a special lane or a signal and you let a bus scoot around traffic stuck at a stoplight and get in front so that when the light turns green, it's the very first vehicle to go. And that way the bus doesn't get stuck. And then transit lane tools. So this is sort of your bus lane. This is actually the best way to maximize value capture for having a bus go through your community. This is a way you can get a bus through. It can be fast and it can be reliable and not get stuck 20, 25 minutes in the morning. So before we make any of these changes, what do we think about at the MBTA? What do we talk about to our cities about? Well, we talk about these things. Accessibility. Does it meet ADA standards? Does it meet MBTA system-wide accessibility standards? And does it sort of make it easier for our, um, our uh, mobility-impacted customers to get around? Speed and reliability. Does it make your service faster? Does it make your service more reliable? Parking. What's going to be the impacts to parking? Is it going to have positive or negative impacts? If it does take away parking, is that something that the city and its citizens are willing to do? Safety. Does it address existing safety concerns or at least maintain a safe corridor? And lastly, customer comfort. Does it improve your customer experience? Sometimes we can, if we make a sidewalk wider, we can now add a bench, we can add a shelter, we can have more clear wayfinding or signs on the side. Other simple things like that. So transit signal priority. So what is transit signal priority? Uh, it really is how we can extend, as how we actually a bus can communicate with a traffic signal. So all of the buses in the MBTA, or nearly all the buses in the MBTA, MBTA system have like a built-in GPS system. So we at the MBTA control center, we can look on a map and we can see where every bus is in the network and how it moves around. So what we can do is we can actually take that information and if I'm a bus going down the road and there's a signal up there, we can actually tell that signal, say, hey, I'm, here comes a bus. If you're about to turn red, don't. Stay green. Let us get through that signal, and we can keep going down the road, and we can get people where they need to go faster. Or if I'm a bus, and I'm coming to a red light, I can say, hey, no, turn green. I'm coming. And it does, and I don't have to stop. And I just keep going through the system. So that's what transit signal priority is. There's a whole lot of background for how that works, but that's what it does. It gets buses through intersections faster. So the outcomes of that, it can improve your reliability, it can reduce your travel time, and it can increase the capacity of our system. So it also is better service for our current customers, and we can also start to attract new riders. If they start seeing a more reliable and fast service, more people will want to ride the bus because it's going to get them down the road where they need to go very predictably. So our TSP pilot strategy. So we spent 2015, 2016 figuring out all that software and all that background stuff so I, as a bus, can tell that signal I need to go through it. So in 2017, 2018, we now have funding to pilot a number of different corridors, corridors in Brookline, some in Boston, Cambridge, Watertown, and we're working actually closely with Arlington now to do one on Mass Ave as part of this project as well. So we're going to look to implement that later this year. And then we're going to look at future opportunities in 2019 after this pilot and see if there's other corridors that we can look at transit signal priority. So our future program, we're going to focus on high ridership, high delay corridors. We're going to try and piggyback on other traffic projects that cities might be doing, especially if cities are going in and upgrading their signals. We want to talk to them right away and say, hey, if you're going to, if you're going to buy new signal equipment, you only spend a little bit more money and you can get the ones that work with our TSP program. We also want to work uh, with municipalities that are really eager to partner. We can't come in and pay for all any, everything that needs to happen, but if cities have money on the table or they're already doing construction project where they can just make a few tweaks, um, that, those are the really great opportunities for us to work with them. Also, we want to concentrate on candidate corridors where there are people are considering dedicated bus lanes. TSP and a dedicated bus lane work really, really well together. TSP isn't going to solve everything. But if you work TSP and a bus lane, that really kind of is the best way that you can get a bus through a system. And so I think that's where we want to focus our energy, but we also want to work with any city who just wants to talk with us about opportunities. So with that, I think I'm going to hand it back over to Jenny. It's the end of my presentation. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm actually, we're going to pause for a second because we're going to get this mic out. If you have a question, I'm going to ask you to queue up somewhere around here, maybe over here. Allie's going to help. Sean's going to come down, right? So, um, so real quickly, um, one, one thing that we 
we didn't mention that I wanted to make sure I mentioned is in the beginning slide, actually, uh, you may have seen the logo for you know, the city of Cambridge seal. We also had the Department of Conservation and Recreation um, seal. That's because this project also includes city of Cambridge and DCR because when we talk about Alewife Brook Parkway, we're talking about that signal, which includes Cambridge and DCR. That's really a critical intersection to this project, just as critical as the other uh, locations that we've been talking about, um, and particularly around the congestion issue. So we really recognize that it's not just uh, the rest of the corridor, but it's what happens when you get to that particular in intersection. So we will be uh, addressing that issue as well as part of this pilot. Um, so in terms of uh, your, the questions that you might have this evening, thought I'd just prep to say, you know, again, just as a reminder, the details about what we're doing here in town, that's gonna be rolled out in the schedule that I mentioned earlier. So we're not gonna be able to answer specifics about what does the pilot look like here exactly in Arlington. That'll be discussed at a future forum. Also, if you have particular suggestions, you know, if you have an idea right now, a burning idea about what we should be looking at or investigating as part of this pilot or in the scenario development that I was talking about earlier, we would love it for you to write it down on that piece of paper that's on every chair um, and provide it maybe at the front uh, when you're on your way out. And also as a quick reminder, if you didn't sign in, we would love to have you sign in so that we could follow up with you and keep in touch along the way um, as this project keeps on moving forward. Uh, last thing I wanna say just on housekeeping is um, I think that there's, uh, are there other materials up there? There's a fact sheet, right? Or there's some other information that you might also want to pick up on your way out because whatever you've learned here tonight, we would love it also for you to share that with other people um, so that you, you know, feel a little better informed this evening and you can share that information with others about what you learned, what you heard, and of course also remind people to continue to participate as we move along this process. So um, I thought I saw somebody <laughs> who might have a question. And, I'll, and if you could... Um, your name, your affiliation, if there's any. Uh, and I'll, I'll help direct the question. I'm Cody Beauclair. I'm a resident of Arlington, but I also work at Nuance, which is on the 3, 350 bus route. Um, and I had uh, two kind of brief questions regarding the transit signal priority. Uh, the first is, how will this affect the pedestrian wait times for the signals? Like, will will it be that we may need to wait even longer than usual at traffic signals that already have a long cycle before a walk light? I think that might be a question for Wes, perhaps. Um, and this is about pedestrians and their ability to cross. Please. Yeah, um, I think it is on. Uh, well, actually, no, it's not on. You know what? I think there's another. Is there one more mic? Yeah. There is. Okay, I, okay, I can hear you now. Oh, you did um, so it, it's actually kind of what we happen, what we end up doing is we actually work with the town to adjust the signal timing. So there's different ways you can adjust pedestrian timing. And we want to make sure that we're actually working with the town and figure out how they want to prioritize uh, pedestrian crossing as well. Sometimes you can sort of set up pedestrian timing to override anything else. Sometimes okay. you say you want to only have pedestrian signals going sort of um, you know, horizontally or longitudinally, not laterally. So there's different ways to program that. Okay, because, yeah, the, uh, the, the main reason I was asking was because the last time that there was a major signal change uh, at Swan Place, they, they ended up setting it up where um, only one direction had a signal, and so it made it very dangerous to cross in the other direction. Um, the other question that I had was, will, is, is this something that, this may be something that's still undecided, but will transit signal priority apply only during the rush hour period of the pilot, or will it be uh, active at all times while the pilot is ongoing? Uh, so the way that the system has been talked about, and I think this is a conversation we want to have the town, is usually it only is active when the bus is behind schedule, which typically is mostly during the peak period, sometimes during the day as well. But if the bus is on schedule, we actually don't activate transit signal priority typically. That way the bus can essentially stay on schedule rather than getting ahead of time. Okay. Great, thank you. Thanks for your questions and thanks to Wes for the answers.
Other questions? Joe. Good to know you. <laughs> Good evening. Uh, Joe Barr, I live on Park Street in East Arlington. I'm a daily, or mostly daily, uh, bus rider. Um, I guess I'll just say I, I was on the master plan advisory committee and I was also, I'm also the co-chair now of the master plan implementation committee. So I just wanted to, re, I guess, reiterate for everybody, perhaps the, what, what Jenny said at the beginning, which is this, the idea of improving transportation and improving transit service and bus service in particular was very much a goal of the master plan. And I think that it's great from the perspective of someone who's been involved in that process since early 2013 both on the development and the implementation of the plan to see a pilot like this coming to fruition. So I think all the, you know, the master plan implementation committee certainly shares the town staff's excitement uh, about this. Uh, I did have a question, which is, or me, it, I'm not gonna, I think, tell anyone, anyone they don't know, but obviously the, this corridor was the subject of a lot of discussion many years ago that led to its current configuration and fortunately now has bike lanes on it, and I think one thing we just need to understand is, I don't know if you have any initial thoughts, if not, that's fine, because I recognize you haven't gotten to that point yet, but about how you're gonna continue to accommodate cyclists and, and any impact that this might have on that um, carefully crafted design that we wound up with. Thanks. Thanks, Joe. Um, thanks for your comment and your thoughts. And I guess there's a question in there if anybody feels equipped to answer that question. Not sure we know I the answer I didn't, exactly I didn't catch the, yet. the question, Julia. I didn't catch the question. The question is about um, how we might address bikes while also addressing bus priority. How, how that, that there might be any impact in relation to bikes. bikes. And, and the existing bike lanes as well. Right, because they're all, they're new, right? I, I'm the infrastructure newish. is newish. Yeah, I mean, it's exciting that Mass Ave has undergone this transformation and has new stripings and it has these pedestrian bump outs and bike lanes and things that are clearly reflective of your master planning process, I believe. I would think this came out of a vision. So we're cognizant of that. And we currently have the, the designers um, at work coming, sketching up scenarios of what can we do with this, this space, taking into consideration not just the spatial restraints, but also the existing conditions and priorities of the, of the community. So, I mean, the bike lanes certainly aren't going away, I can tell you that. Um, we are not sure what these designs are going to look like, and it'll be exciting in August to be able to unveil that. And we're looking forward to getting those back from the consultants in, in I think, in a few weeks or a month or so. So. And you know, in the places like in Everett, they have their dedicated lane. It's actually they have a bike lane striped in with the bus lane, and that's that's how they do it, and it's working well there. Um, that's that particular corridor, so it remains to be seen how that will work here. But absolutely, the the priority of bicyclists it will remain. Anybody else? Ralph. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I would just add that. Part of the design process is to make sure that we're accommodating all of the users of the roadway. I think you heard most of us speak about the kind of space allocations. And, you know, ultimately that's what this becomes about. And part of what we'll be looking at and measuring are the impacts and benefits and challenges and opportunities for all of the users of the roadway. And whether that's parking or pedestrians or bicyclists or transit users or motorists, that's ultimately what we have to try to get to. That's why this is going to take longer than just go out and do it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yes. The Everett approach doesn't necessarily <laughs> work in Arlington. <laughs> no. Thank you. Um, I think you're, you're next. Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Brian, and I live in uh, East Arlington on, the, on Fairmont Street. Uh, I've been there for, since about uh, December 2015, so I was lucky I got, actually got there after they finished the, the roadway uh, redevelopment. But the, the big question I have, and I've been riding the 77 bus for as, as long as that, uh, since I've been there to Harvard uh, University every day. And one of the biggest things I've noticed there in the process is, is how the bottleneck seems to be somewhat more Cambridge up to Porter Square standpoint than anything else going for the whole route. I, I obviously haven't experienced anything from uh, Arlington Heights because I live two blocks from the Brook uh, Parkway. But I'm wondering if, if Cambridge has been brought in to, into the discussion about signal light uh, timing and things like that, because that always seems to be what seems to be the, the slowdown, at least for my portion of the riding of it. Sure, excellent, um, and thank you for that. Um, Cambridge is involved in this project, but at the parkway on the tre uh, TSP is West, is there anything about what they might be doing on the Mass Ave sec section? Yeah, from, from the parkway to, right. to Porter. from beyond. 
So I'm, I don't actually, I'm not familiar with the, what the work Cambridge is doing. I know that we've engaged them in conversations. An Andy, I'm looking at Andy, one of our service members at the ABT. I don't know if you've had a conversation with them as well. Cambridge has done some preliminary work looking at um, the intersection of Mass Ave and Walden, um, but nothing is materialized from that as of yet. I think the biggest, the biggest problem with the 70s. Yeah, please. I, th I think the biggest issue with the 77 bus is that if you were to have the, the, the quick aspect be from Arlington Heights to Edward Brook Parkway, you're going to have bus stacking as soon as they hit Cambridge. Okay. Because the, the bottleneck has always been between the Brook Parkway and Porter. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's, I think, the biggest concern that I have is that you'd, okay. you'd have a great speed up in the beginning, but eventually mm -hmm. it would just fall apart at the end. Yeah. Yeah, it definitely helps that Cambridge is also involved in their own uh, bus pilot on Mount Auburn Street. So obviously they're, they're privy to all of this. And one of the great things about doing these pilots is to see what works on this corridor. And if it works, how can we expand it to the rest of the corridor, recognizing that it's the same riders um, and the, that the issues continue as it moves on. So we hope to apply the lessons learned from this one as it goes into Cambridge. And I don't anticipate any barriers of Cambridge being on board with doing something like that. Great. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Phil Goff. I'm at 94 Grafton Street, and I'm with uh, East Arlington Livable Streets Coalition. And um, I wanted to commend all three of the speakers, the three or four, I guess. <laughs> um, the presentations were just great. Um, I think I'm confident that, that people really learned a lot about BRT. Um, Wes, in particular, talked a lot about TSP. Um, you had mentioned, or maybe Julie did as well, um, queue jumping. Um, you didn't really talk about it much. I'm just wondering if you could help us understand that a little better. I'm sort of envisioning that it means perhaps removing, you know, one or two parking spaces adjacent to a signal, and then would it involve then a special bus-only signal? Is that something that's federally MUTCD approved, like new bike signals that allow just a bus uh, to proceed ahead of the cars? Could you just talk about that? A little bit more, because I think there's some real potential there. Yeah, no, um, I, Wes, do you want me to go back to your slide that had the TSP on it? Uh, sure, I, can, I probably can do a pretty good job explaining it. All too. right, well, I'm just so. going to show it on the screen at the same time. Great. So um, a queue jump can be done in a lot of different ways. Probably the easiest way you can think about it is if you have, say, two lanes of traffic, but then there's like a right turn lane, the cars uh, sort of off to the side, the cars always have to turn to the right. You might say, you know what, buses actually can go in that lane and go straight through. And then you can give them their own signal. There is MUTCD. Um, there's no exclusion for uh, bus signals, uh, exclusive bus signal sort of in the far right lane if a bus needs to get around to the front. So sometimes it does require actually taking parking. Sometimes you can just get by with like taking a space or two or utilize an existing right turn space. But if it's like a really congested corridor, sometimes you do have to take a lot of parking spots because a bus could get stuck really far back. And you essentially create what's like what would essentially be like a short <coughs> bus lane on the right side mm -hmm. that allows a bus to scoot to the front. Mm -hmm. But it just sort of depends on sort of what sort of the existing infrastructure and roadway looks like now and sort of how congested that corridor gets. I would also add that in the, um, in the local context, a queue jump can often coincide with a right turn only lane for general traffic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. My name is Jim Gascoigne. I live at 77 Gray Street here in Arlington. I run Charles River Transportation Management Association in Cambridge. Uh, which includes a uh, bus service from North Station through circulation in um, in and out Cambridge, mostly in the um, uh, commercial and industrial area. I want to toss a softball question because I think it's really important here in Massachusetts where we value the fact that, that we uh, uh, have significant powers in our towns. And uh, I think I know the answer to the question, but if you have three buses, 79, 77, and 350, that run the length of Mass Ave and they end at uh, Arlington Heights and you have very limited parking here. Uh, who do these buses serve and who's gonna be riding these buses and who will be gaining the advantage if they move faster in the town of Arlington uh, to get where they're going? Yeah, Ralph did a good job starting to answer that question in his presentation, so we'll follow that I up. I apologize. I was here late, if I apologize for missing that. No, it, and, and it's a very good question, and that's, that's, I think, part of what we tried to show with some of the ridership information 
uh, and the cumulative load factors is this, the people that are on these buses are your friends and neighbors. 97% plus of the folks that are riding the 77 and 79 walked or biked to the stop. So sort of by definition, they're, they're coming from Arlington. Thank you. I really want to emphasize that. That's why we need to do this. Great. Thank you, and thanks for answering. Hi. Hi, I'm Jonathan Weiss. I'm a resident of East Arlington and a crazy four-season bicycle commuter. Um, so I may not be on the buses as much as some other people, but uh, they're certainly out there. Um, you talked a little bit about uh, TSP, and we touched on queue jumping. Uh, one of the things I've noticed as a cyclist, and I can only imagine it's worse if you're in a car, is when a bus pulls into a bus stop, there is a giant bus end sticking way out into the street. Um, and if we, I, I understand the goal and the, the benefit of, of the TSP and the bus jumping to get those buses out and in front, um, but if what you end up doing is putting them in front of a line of cars and then having them block the bike lane and sometimes half or even the entire right lane of traffic, um, I'm concerned about the, the, the sort of unintended consequences there, and I was curious if you had thought about that or plan for that. Um, obviously, this is in situations where you can't have the dedicated bus lane. Yeah, I was going to say it definitely lends itself to why we want dedicated bus lanes so that doesn't ever happen. Yeah, but and, in and the and cases having, where that's not possible. Yeah, having heard the uh, emotional discussions when we reconfigured Mass Ave, I just don't know. You know, I, if it works, great, but I'm nervous. So I, I think Ralph may want to answer this. Yeah, and, and I think part of what the team will have to look at are places where perhaps the bus stops need to be designed slightly differently, moved from one side of the street to the other, sort of as Wes was describing, yeah. mm -hmm. or made... One side of the block. Yeah, one side of, you know, yeah. one side of the block, you, rather yeah. than being near side, you move from the far side, uh, or the stops may need to be made longer, right? Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are the things we have to look at. I think one of the things we'll hear, and it would be great if you wrote these down on your comment cards too, if you're in your observational powers, there are particular intersections or bus stops where this is frequently happening. Those would be good things for us to know. Oh. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to <laughs> signal to you. Okay, Th thank you very much. Yeah, and I might just quickly add to it. I think that there's also different opportunities for the way you design your bus lane and sort of how you design how a bus can pull over to a bus stop. Then you make actually maybe a little bit wider bus lane and sort of like a shared bus bike lane. We've seen bus, like bus lanes, we need like 11 feet of width. We're seeing places they might put 15 feet of width where they might have a shared facility. You can also do what are called curb bulbs, which is sort of a way that a bus pulls, oh, doesn't have to pull all the way over to a curb. They could say more in the lane of traffic, but you might make them like a three quarter or a two third curb bulb. Mm -hmm. So they can pull over a couple feet and then it actually clears space to the left for a bike to get around rather than having to pull all the way into a stop. Because actually when a bus has to pull all the way to a curb sort of in a parking lane, a bus takes a, it needs a lot of room in front of it and behind it because obviously yeah. a bus can't parallel park. Yeah. So the more you can actually like provide a curb bulge so that the bus just scoots over a little bit, um, the easier it is for a bus to get over. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And it, just to reiterate, that, that the whole bus stop relocation or consolidation, that is one of the tasks as we develop this scenario. So I think that that will come up as we're vetting this. Hi, my name is my name is Mark Kaplan. I've been a resident in Arlington for well, almost 30 years. Oh, by the way, so the project has already been done to lengthen bus stops and to locate them, relocate them. Um, but the real reason is buses they can't get back out in the traffic, so they don't pull in all the way. Uh, my question is, if you're going to if you're working with Mass Dot to help update their policies. Because uh, with the Mass Ave project, a lot of short-sighted decisions were made. Um, originally, selectmen wanted one lane each way, if you can imagine that, <laughs> and how miserable that would be today. Um, but this, for example, bump outs, there's actually very little documented research support 
for a safety improvement or reduction in crashes from them, and yet they impede your projects for setting up a bus lane. Uh, plus the reality is here we have snow and they make snow removal more difficult too. So Mark, uh, Mark, is your question to Wes about policy change potentially at MassDOT? Yeah, working okay. with them to educate them. Because so also they insist on having bike lanes, which maybe only serve one or two percent of the population compared to a greater number of bus riders. We already have a bi bike path. So I'm hoping you can help them fix that policy too, because they insist on bike lanes, whether or not they make sense at all. So let me, let me see if Wes will take a stab at answering the question about and MassDOT policy change. So MassDOT has, is developing what they have a, called a complete streets guideline. So they actually look at a multimodal view of different corridors and they engage their participating towns and sort of what they want those corridors to look like and help design them. So I think that, that you know, there's a trade-off and I think it's sort of working with the communities to understand if they, want to, if they want bike lanes, bus lanes, if they want to prioritize the movement of vehicles and how, on, how, how wide it's they are. It's not a choice. Sidewalks. So I think it's part of the process of really engaging the community to figure out what the type of... No, want to communities let, don't get a choice. Um, let's let, let's bike let lanes are no money. Mark, let's let him answer, and then if you'd like to ask another question, you can do that as a follow-up. Well, he's new here, so I, I'm trying well, to help him out. I'm, I'm new here too, but I'm going to let him continue to answer. Thank you. Well, I, I think that's the end of my answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, that <laughs> was the answer. Question. <laughs> okay. So we actually have a long line. Is there a follow-up question that you have, or are you, are you complete? Okay, so you are working with MassDOT to help them revise their policies yeah, we're to talking prioritize motor vehicle bus transit? Yes, we're talking with MassDOT actively about what their complete street design guides look like and how they engage okay, cities. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pam Hallett. I'm Executive Director of the Housing Corporation of Arlington, and I live in the very end of Arlington, so one Gilboa place, the very west side, uh, Arlington Heights. I always, always called it Chicago Heights. Um, so when I leave to go to a meeting on the east side of Arlington, anywhere between 7.30 in the morning and 9 o'clock, it takes me over half an hour to go down Mass Ave to get just to the east side of Arlington, not even to Cambridge. Any other time of the day, it takes less than 10 minutes. Um, why was the section from Lake Street to Alewife chosen as the pilot? Since once we get past, say, right around Town Hall, traffic moves pretty smoothly until you hit the Cambridge problem. So can you tell me why yeah, the pilot was chosen for that section? Really, primarily, Pam, to address the congestion in that particular part of the corridor. Um, I think in uh, Ralph's slides, we were, we were shown that there is a 34-minute, 37 37-minute wait total. I'm sorry. The exact yeah, I, time was you on your probably slide. probably bring it back up. And the, the different but routes we, have different scheduled we times. We had looked at, and, and Adam may want to follow up on this. Let me just finish real, real quick. But the, uh, th that was the primary focus for that part of the project. But we're also looking at the corridor as a whole. So we will be looking at the entire corridor for the other elements that we were talking about. So it's not just the, the pilot may occur in the, in the locations that we were just talking about, but we're looking at the other elements across the entire length of the Mass Ave corridor. Yeah, and Adam, do you want to? The entire was, corridor was included in the proposal and for, for the grant purposes. Adam? Oh. Okay. I think you have to turn that off. At Mystic. I, I believe you said this in your opening yeah. slide that the actual the um, complete corridor limits for what we're looking at that would look at Q-Jumps and TSP is from Mystic to the AOF Brook Parkway, and it was just from Lake Street to the AOF Brook Parkway that we would consider looking at a dedicated lane. The dedicated right lane, correct. So mm -hmm. we're, it's not all the way to the heights, but we are looking at a longer stretch than what um, than just Lake Street to the Parkway. Okay. Yeah, there is actually another mic on the table over there yeah, next right to here. Julia. Uh, next to, yeah. there we go. Hi, um, oh. you, hello? It'll start in a second. Here, there it goes. It's on. 
Hi. <laughs> Why don't you introduce yourself? Yes, please. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> my name is Andy Smith. I'm a service planner for uh, the Bennett Street Somerville District. Um, so um, I am um, involved with a lot of the data analysis. Um, our fleet, um, as it's moving down the road, is constantly collecting data um, on its position, on its lateness, and um, we have found that the segment um, of those three routes um, that I just mentioned um, between Lake and uh, Elwife Park Parkway going inbound can cause eight to ten minutes of delay, um, and that is pretty substantial. Um, so that is one of the reasons why we're targeting that particular segment in East Arlington, because one, we feel that that's the most congested segment for shown by our, uh, our, our data that we collect on the buses uh, in, in, in Arlington. Okay. Thank I would you. like you to look at from the heights down. I think it's longer, actually. Right, right. There are other segments probably where these types of techniques would be beneficial, too. Um, but uh, I think that uh, the one from, from Lake down onto uh, Elwife Brook Parkway at this time is the one that's in the greatest need. And so, and part of this process is learning about and evaluating all of the corridors. So if we do find opportunities to make other interventions, that might be something we can address. But the, the focus of the pilot is, is in the place that we already talked about. Thank you. Yes. Hi there. Um, I'm Suzanne Stice. I live in East Arlington. I work in Fresh Pond in Cambridge. And I walk, take the bus, drive to work, depending on the weather, my mood, and if my car is working. Um, and so I was just wondering, is there any data, will there be any data um, collected about why people drive in the city on Mass Ave and why they're not taking the bus now? Is it because of the reliability of the bus and it being so bad, or is it because they have meetings at different parts of the city. Are they disabled and they can't, they can't walk to the bus and take the bus? Um, do they have kids dropping them off at different schools? I think, so that's my question. I, I think, Ralph, sorry, Ralph go, ahead. go ahead. Go um, ahead. I'm just going to adjust this. Go ahead, Ralph. Sure. Oh, when, yes. I, when I talk about <laughs> sort of survey data and perception data, I think that's where we would get at some of that information from folks specifically we talked to you know, on the street, online, what have you. You know, we'll balance that against hard technical data from census or that you guys have developed through the master plan or anything like that that's also talking about the same things. So we'll try to compare it to what's happening on the street. Ultimately, you know, I think what we've seen where other pilots have been put in place is when you make the service better and more reliable, people's willingness, I think I showed a couple of stats, people's willingness to ride the service you know, becomes a lot greater, mm -hmm. you know, and, and we'll even be tracking ridership, I think, during, during the piloted time. Okay. So hopefully that, that, that's one of the things we're hoping to get to. Yeah. Um, and has ridership gone up in other um, cities that this has been implemented? And oh, if yeah. so, by how much? Yeah, I don't want to speak off the cuff here and, and give you numbers, but I think we, we've all collectively seen that and can show those numbers, both from a pilot perspective and certainly from a permanent BRT installation perspective. Those numbers are through the roof. Okay. Um, just one yeah, more. Yeah, I was just going to say, and we will be actually doing some evaluation by survey. When I was mentioning earlier in the introduction about the street team, part of the function of the street team is to do some survey work of people mm -hmm. both before the pilot, during the pilot, and after the pilot. And that'll be about asking things about perception of ridership, perception of ease, all of those other things, which I think in part Ralph was about, uh, talking about in his presentation as well. Yeah, and if you're interested in that topic, I just want to give a plug to Livable Streets Alliance has a Better Bus report that was recently released. It's uh, on the web. Just just Google it, Better Bus report on the Livable Streets Alliance. It has a lot of the so perceptions, experience, rider, rider wants, needs, would you, could you, things like that. So Okay, um, and I'm all for making the bus more reliable, but I'm just worried from a practical sense, maybe just because it's more on time more often, it won't, more people won't use it and there'll still be the, the same number of cars, but just in one lane. Mm -hmm. And then pulling on to Mass Ave from all the side streets will get backed up and more carbon emissions on the side street, on the residential areas. 
I, I'm not sure that we have an answer to that yeah. in terms of it. It's a, it's a good yeah. observation. It may mm -hmm. be something that we need to look at and study when we're actually evaluating the scenarios to figure out what the related impacts will be. That's all part of when we're looking at and developing the scenarios is what would be the impact, positive, negative? What are some of the trade-offs as part of that mm -hmm. process? Okay. So Great. thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, hello, Steve Revelak. I live in Sunnyside Avenue in Arlington, and I'm another one of those crazy four-season cyclists. However, for about six years, my daily commute, my daily morning commute, was to walk from East Arlington to Porter Square, and then from Porter Square, I would take a uh, commuter train out to Concord and go to work. And my reason for walking um, to Porter Square was during the morning rush hour, um, if I were to leave enough time to make sure that I, you know, leave enough time to go catch the 77 and get there in time to catch my train, well, it was actually faster to walk. To walk. So I, I want to express a lot of gratitude for the town and for all of the different groups involved who are looking at this issue and, and taking it seriously. Um, I do have a question. And this might be for Julia or whoever answers it, but I'm just, I know we're just in the pilot phase, but I'm curious, are there special considerations when it comes to uh, BRT and um, snowstorms? Special considerations for BRT and yeah, snowstorms? Does, do, does a blizzard, um, does, does BRT require... Is there anything special? Oh, um, if we were to install full-scale gold yeah. standard BRT, mm -hmm. it, I mean, it's, it's a robust piece of infrastructure mm -hmm. um, that it's not something you can put in overnight. It involves construction and mm -hmm. stations and concrete. So um, absolutely, and there are new vehicles that would be designed for, the, for this particular climate. So ab absolutely, the system would, would be designed to be robust for where it's going to function. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll just quickly add to the MBTA too. One of the things we do okay. work with cities on is trying to make sure that we get the roadways cleared for our buses. And so I think if we were to talk about bus lanes and cities, trying to prioritize those, knowing that those will be highly <laughs> high ridership, high, high frequency corridors, and trying to get those up and running as fast as we can. Great. Thank you, both of you. Hi, I'm Jennifer Litowski. I live in East Arlington, and I a bike and take transit to work in East Cambridge every day. Uh, we also use both um, biking and transit and our cars on the weekend for trips, errands, activities. So we use a lot of different modes here. So definitely I want to thank the town of Arlington for considering this project and moving ahead on it. There's no scenario where we don't need more and better transit in the area. I also want to thank the town for the bike lanes on Mass Avenue. I use them daily. It makes a difference. I wouldn't be there if it wasn't for them. But my question in particular is with regard to the opening of the Gibbs School in, next fall. So we're going to be opening this middle, sixth grade middle school in East Arlington. For the first time, we're going to have significant numbers of, of sixth grade students taking the bus in the eastward direction to get to elementary school, or, sorry, to get to middle school. Are the plans taking this into account, the increased numbers, and any special outreach to the schools to handle this? Did you know it was even going to happen? Because it's not just the commuters in, on weekday mornings. It's going to be a lot of 12-year-olds. Uh, You're talking about school buses or on no, the buses? No, on the oh, buses. Okay. Actual bus. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, Adam. Thank you, Jen, and I, I see you in those bike lanes most mornings, so I can, <laughs> I can attest, I can attest yeah. to that. Um, so I, I think a lot of that impact will be before where we're looking at the dedicated bus lane because the Gibbs is before that Lake Street intersection and the OF Brook Parkway. But I think as uh, the engineer team starts to look at it, we will have to see what spikes in ridership that might cause and what impacts that might have on the implementation of a queue jump or, or you know, I, I guess what could happen is in, improvements we're making on timing or load factor, as Ralph described, could be negatively impacted or reduced by the increase in the ridership for that window of time in the morning. So we, we will have to take that into account yeah. as we're, as we're you know, assessing what our success may or may not be. And will this be only in the eastward direction or the westward direction? I.e., will it help our students going to the high school and to Audison, or is it only for people going eastbound? Right now, just eastbound. Okay. For the purposes of this project. Yes. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name 
name's Robin Johnson. I uh, live in East Arlington. I've lived there for about um, 10 years. I rode my bike to this meeting. I ride my bike a lot along Mass Ave, and I'm very happy about the bike lanes. It makes all of the difference. Um, for me, not being a year-round cyclist, being de definitely a slower, more fair-weather cyclist, um, it, it's much better for me to, to have bike lanes along Mass Ave. Um, I, my one concern with this project that I think other people have alluded to is I'm concerned that we're going to be having this pilot along Arlington part of Mass Ave and then everything in Cambridge is just going to be the same and it's just everything's going to fall apart I feel like and the bunching may be worse and we maybe get different results than if we would have just done done it along the whole 77 or 70, I mean, the same thing with along Alewife Work Parkway, I feel like is going to happen. Um, I know that these pilots aren't perfect, and I sure wish Cambridge would have decided to cooperate with us and do their part on Mass Ave for the pilot, but I guess they can do what they want. Um, my other uh, comment or question would be, has, um, has the MBTA in Arlington ever considered some sort of 77 Express going out of Harvard Square. Whenever I'm going out of Harvard Square in the afternoon, it seems like there's two groups of riders. There's the Arlington riders who are just going to be sitting on the bus all the way out to Arlington. Then there's a group of riders who are in Cambridge who will take either the 96 or the 83 or the 77 or the 77A, which only serves them, uh, you know, they'll, they'll take any of those. So they'll just hop on the first bus that comes. So we have buses, and, and the frequency is too, uh, there's too many buses for the length of route, and maybe this pilot will help that. But I feel like if we could alternate buses during rush hour, one being like a 77 Express that only stops in Porter Square uh, in Cambridge, and then just goes on the rest of the way, and then have a 77, not, not the cable, not the ones with the electric cables or whatever, but maybe just have a 77 that just goes within Cambridge. Because these buses are bunching up anyways, it seems like it would be better, if, we're, if they're gonna be bunching up, it would be better to plan the bunching so that they're not, so each bus is not having to stop at all the stops to let off all the Cambridge people. It seems like to have one bus just, that can just go straight through Cambridge because I just, I mean, I'm in East Arlington. I don't have such a terrible commute. I just feel terrible for all of the people in Arlington Heights who have to sit through the bus stopping 13 different stops in Cambridge, where those Cambridge people could have hopped on any of the numerous buses that go out of Harvard Square. And it seems to me a pretty basic idea, but so I'm just curious if that's been considered. Yeah, yeah. And it seems like we kind of already have that with the 77A. Um, and this seems like something that Arlington should be very interested in. It's not going to help people in Cambridge so much, but it's definitely going to help people in Arlington. That's well, my call. Yep. We're going to be fielding comments from the public at upcoming future meetings. Mm hmm Suggestions for just a route. I've made this suggestion numerous times in my MBTA surveys. Yeah, so I'll diverge from this project a little bit, talk about some of the other efforts the MBT is undertaking. And we, I'm just going to ask for the sake of the yep. seven people waiting right. who might want to ask about this, but just quickly on the... Yes, I'll keep it very brief. But we're, So we're doing a process over the next year, uh, through the end of this year, that we're looking at all 175 routes in our system and trying to find ways that we can make them faster, more reliable, also try to figure out are there ways that we want to change them to better serve our customers. And actually, I'm writing down your feedback right now because that's actually one of the types of things that we're considering right now. We're going to go to our Great. board at the end of this year with a number of recommendations that we're collecting. We're also going to have a website, www.mbta.com slash better bus. There's we'll a survey there. there. If you haven't filled it already, please go there. You can select which routes you ride and mm -hmm. actually talk specifically about challenges you've faced on those routes. And for anybody in this room, please go to that website. We're happy to take your feedback. Great. Thank you. Thank you. And again, we are working with Cambridge on this project, and where we see opportunities to do things differently along this corridor, we're going to try to seize those opportunities through this process. Mm -hmm. So we're all at the table. Hi. 
Hello, my name is Rachel Stark. I live on Randolph Street in East Arlington in Capitol Square, and I am with Walking in Arlington. Um, two things. The 77 bus starts out in bunches, both in Arlington Heights and in Harvard Square. Frequently, we will wait 30 minutes and three come. It is completely unacceptable, absolutely unacceptable. You, you're killing business in Arlington because people would shop by bus if it came. It's extremely unreliable. It's faster to walk. Everybody knows that. Um, what are you going to do to improve the reliability? Because there's nothing to prioritize <laughs> at this point because the 77, like, never comes. So that's my first question. How are you going to prioritize it when it's so unreliable? How are you going to make it more reliable? Wes. Yeah, so I think part of the effort with looking at bus lanes, looking at TSP, looking at all the different options is to try and actually get it more reliable. If it doesn't fit the schedule today, that's because it's, it, it just can't get down the road. And so we want to figure out a way that we can actually make it move down the road and meet its schedule. So all of these things that we're talking about today are efforts to try and get there. That would be great. Thank you. My other question is, um, will the police be enforcing the traffic law? When I've asked the police, why don't you enforce the traffic law more, they basically say, well, we can't. Like, gee, I thought that was your job. Um, the, the traffic law is not enforced in a lot of ways. People run red lights, you know, all kinds of stuff. How are we going to enforce the, the additional traffic law that we'll need to do here to make this work when they don't even enforce the stuff that's on the books now? How, how are we going to inc improve the enforcement of the traffic law? Adam. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's very nice of you to try. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so I think, I think in, ge in, in general, in terms of enforcement of traffic law, it's not um, a lack of desire or will to enforce traffic infractions or traffic law. It's, it's a resources issue. And when, when there is a significant call or a thing to be responded to in Arlington, uh, most police resources are dedicated to that. So there's not right now, um, based on some, some hiring we're doing, a dedicated traffic on the street resource. To, to improve traffic enforcement, we would have to have a dedicated on the street traffic enforcement resource. Um, in terms of this pilot, uh, I think I heard Julia mention that in some of the other pilots in the area, there's been concern about how to not um, tax town or city resources too much in enforcement. So I think as we develop these options, we're going to have to take a look at what that, what that burden would be in terms of resources for enforcement if some higher level of enforcement was needed. Okay. I mean, so traffic enforcement is a, is a life and death issue. So it's a big deal, and I think the police should be putting more of their resources into it. Fortunately, you know, we don't have a lot of shoot 'em up in Arlington, but we have a lot of people injured on the road. So let's work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go on to the next question. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, hi, my name is T. Sun Al Young. I live on Varnum Street in East Arlington, and I want to add to. Um, uh, to, you know, add to the point that um, the previous lady had was that the, uh, the bump out on the mass F is actually create more safe crossing because the road was too wide. The each traffic lane was too wide to begin with, at, 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 you know, before this project started. Um, I actually wasn't going to mention that. I was actually wanting to ask about how the, M I actually, I, I have seen the problem. I'm luckily that I'm actually having a reverse commute usually on the, outbound bicycling on Mass Ave at like 8 o'clock and I see that all these cars as you know try to go down to L wife and um, and I feel I feel bad for the bus for the bus uh, bus taker who um, actually for the for the bus route 79 and 350 have you considered like doing the morning rush hour where you divert them onto route 60 and then do route 2 because a lot of the time, when I used to uh, commute toward Elwife, the, the sticking point, uh, Elwife Grove Parkway, there's also the left turn going, you know, going to there, which I see the buses stuck there for 15 minutes, which it, uh, it, which, which com it compact to a lot of people. And to be honest, for the about Route 79 and 350, where if I live in East Arlington, if I want to, if I want to, you know, take the 79 and 350 at 8 o'clock, you know, that was just silly because I walk to LY faster. So that's something that I see that there is could be an opportunity. But when you guys um, actually, find, you know, have success with this uh, bustling project, I, I want to actually be the 
um, 3D Advocate to actually uh, route more bus line onto this project. Consider bus, uh, bus route 67 where it turns to that direction. You know, so if, so if you are having a dedicated bike, uh, bus lane for, you know, at rush hour for that time where majority of people are going to the train station where, you know, express bus lane that way. That may just be comment feedback for this project and things to consider. Yeah. Unless Wes, do you want to? So I'll just add one quick thing. Add something talking about the Better Bus Project a little bit. One of the things we're looking at are what are those opportunities for us consolidating bus service onto major corridors. If we can make improvements in those corridors, they could actually make all the buses there move faster. So that point's well taken. Thank you. Yeah, because um, oh, sorry, because I know that you guys are improving the uh, bus uh, weight into our wife by um, doing right. the. The, the business park loop, which actually I see that it helps because that is the least, uh, least stuck of traffic. So I just want to point it out that since you guys improved that, you guys, I mean, in the short term, might consider to divert the buses to there during rush hour. Thank you. I'm Mark Hallison. I'm from Appleton Street, just inside the Heights. Um, I'm one of the few people from the Heights here who, when I do take the bus, have to sit a very long time all the way into Harvard and sit through a very long time coming back out. And thank you for bringing up the express bus. That was one of my questions to bring that up. Um, another question I have, you showed in some of your examples, the articulated buses they have. Um, Boston only has a few routes with articulated buses which have, can help hold more people on it. And is there any plans to bring those type of buses out into the uh, suburbs? Um, <laughs> on that. That's a and great question. So Wes. I'll quickly end. I think Andy is also ready to answer this. If, if I don't answer, um, I don't have enough an answer. Not so, this. yeah, yeah. So not at yeah. <laughs> That's the short answer. So not at this time. No. Some of the challenges we face with the articulated buses is really during the winter season. Um, they have sort of they have a rear drive axle. So what happens when the bus drives? It, because it's like an accordion, it can actually cur turn the bus in the middle, and it kind of creates a jackknife. So there are challenges with that, and so we have to be really careful about what routes we run those on. And so that's just one of the challenges we face here. And so we, we look to not add to our articulated fleet, except on specific routes where we already run them. And my s second question, um, since you're sort of the data analyst person, um, that's what I sort of do my day job, looking at, um, for fun, I looked at how the buses operate. You call them bunching, but it's something people also don't talk about here is the leapfrogging part of the buses when one bus jumps over another bus to get ahead of it to either bypass a stop to let passengers off and so forth. I see that a lot of times going outbound in the afternoon and evening rushes. How is this supposed to address things like that? How are you going to communicate with your drivers? You know, we, you know, slow down, speed up, or even skip stops to help the flow better. So the education of drivers, mm -hmm. how does that get incorporated into these pilots? Mm -hmm. So one of the things we're doing, and we've actually started this with the Cambridge pilot right now, is thinking about how the operations will change in a corridor, and then how do we actually sort of, how do we develop a program to educate our own drivers to operate better? Part of, I'm gonna go back to the Better Bus Project, because it kind of intertwines all of this. One of the things we're doing is not only thinking about how we change service, but how we can actually better function internally as an agency, like how we dispatch buses to get them on the road quicker, how we can turn them around faster, how we could potentially leapfrog service to think if we could improve service, teach our drivers a new way to sort of um, provide customers or provide a, get to a bus stop and also drop passengers off. So these are kind of all things that we're thinking about behind the scenes. And I think that's good feedback. Thank you. Thanks, Wes, again. Yes. Sir. Yes. Hi, I'm Richard Freeman. We own and operate the uh, Capitol Theater, which has been in continuous operation for almost 100 years in East Arlington. Um, here, just don't, don't touch that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. I'm, I'm up here on behalf of a lot of local businesses in East Arlington. Um, your presentation was very impressive. I learned an awful lot, and I find that <clears throat> the whole subject of transportation, all the, tra all the various pr uh, perspectives you, you have brought to our attention, very interesting particularly the, uh, the TSP option. But I have to say that um, we really didn't hear your perspective on how this is going to impact the local businesses of East Arlington. 
Um, and my question to you is in particular with the, one of the options was a dedicated bus only lane. Um, we're very concerned that is going to have a very detrimental effect on the local businesses, the, the commercial lifeblood and a lot of the cultural uh, energy of East Arlington would be negatively impacted by that. So my question is, how are you going to take into account the impact on uh, local businesses in, in Arlington with the variety of uh, pilot options that you, that you intend to investigate? Would any of you, to? Julia? We're, we're very cognizant of that, and I'm grateful to the town staff, Allie Carter, for sort of keeping us in the loop on uh, the, what's going on in the business community. I know she meets with you regularly. Um, I also want to emphasize that we, we don't know what the designs are going to be, but absolutely outreach to businesses is central um, to these pilots, and we actually have some opportunities to engage further. Um, the Bar Foundation is very interested in sort of giving the business community a voice, maybe even doing some partnership projects with you guys to improve marketing um, and visibility during the pilot. Um, as far as how a dedicated lane would impact the businesses, I think it definitely depends where that dedicated lane is. Is it running in the parking lane? Is it running in a travel lane? And we don't have those answers yet right now. Um, but definitely don't want to convey any sense of, um, you know, that there's some sort of screen up between the designs and the business community and that you, that you, we will ever know something that you don't know. So I don't, I don't know if there's any other better way to answer that, but we're cognizant of that and want to make sure that we are on the same page at all times and that we can even help you. You know, we have capacity to do things like, you know, pay for uh, you know, people to have you know, free movie tickets um, during the pilots, things like that. That's actually part of what this grant can cover and for coffee shops along the line. Free coffee, you know, at Cape Rada coffee shop um, when you take the bus. So those are some ideas that we had and more and we're open to other suggestions for how these pilots can be good for business. Yeah, and I might just add to that too. I mean, to Julia's point, I think we have been talking about how we engage the local community and local businesses as part of the process as well. But I also might offer an example as well. So I came from Seattle, Washington, where we had implemented seven BRT lines that aren't, they actually don't even meet the bronze standard. We call them principal arterial BRT. It's actually very similar to what we're probably talking about here as well. But one of the things we did in Seattle was we actually engaged the Urban Land Institute. They're an organization that looks at like real estate and development and how transportation replace, um, sort of works as part of that discussion. So they actually looked at our bus rapid transit system out in Seattle, Washington to understand what the business aspects were going to be on those corridors. And they found it was actually going to be positive. It was going to be what they call like a, like a transit-oriented development light. So they started to see... They started to see new businesses. They started to see new buildings go in. And actually, the product of that was they had, the businesses were seeing more people come in their doors because new people had access right. to those businesses. And we actually saw ridership in a lot of those, all six of the seven, go up 50% or more. So in some ways, it actually provides a lot more access depending on how you do it, but it's certainly not going to happen in a vacuum. And I think it's really important to engage the business community in the town and how you are planning those services. Well, I think it's very important that you differentiate between all these different communities, what happens where you were in Seattle sure. and what happens in Everett is different from what is happening in East Arlington. And although you've cited various uh, data to show that uh, business has increased, um, we remain, I won't say skeptical, but we want to see that, that that's going to happen. And as at this point, this dedicated bus only lane does not seem like a positive option for our businesses in East Arlington if it takes away our parking. So yeah. I just wanted to make that right point. Right now, we're not um, sure if that's so, what it's going to be or so if let that's me, even possible. Let me see if Adam has the last comment, and then we actually have a few more folks, and we've got a little less time. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. I'll be very brief. Yeah. Thank you. So, Richard, I just want to say I, I think there's, there's probably three issues that are on the top of my mind. One is impacts on businesses uh, based on whatever it is that we do, uh, whether it be parking or changes to right turn lanes that make huge jumps, whatever it might be, uh, parking related issues and impacts on businesses top of my mind. Impact on existing congestion is top of my mind. 
mean, we don't want to negatively impact businesses. We don't want to create more traffic congestion. And the third on my mind is what happens with bike accommodations. I certainly don't want to have a negative impact on the existing bike accommodations, as I think the first or second speaker brought up. So those are the, at least from just, just speaking for myself and my view of this, yeah. those are the top three things on my mind. And we're certainly not going to make any decisions in a vacuum without continuing to talk to you and the other business owners in the East. And, and again, we've set up numerous meetings now, I think, within East Arlington that we're planning to have. The, the first one is June 14th at the Fox Library at something o'clock, 4.30. <laughs> so uh, please feel free to join us. PM, yes, please don't come in the morning. <laughs> Hi, my name is Suva Calfotis. I own and work at Olympic Pizza. Uh, we've been there for over 20 years. I hear that the pilot program is from um, Lake Street to Ella Whitebrook Parkway, but is it going to be on the other side? The other side is one lane. Will it take off the parking spaces? I mean, one, our side is one lane only going up towards the center, correct? This parking there, will it take out the parking? We're also at the corner of Cleveland Street. Now, during rush hour, at 4 o'clock, 4.30, you see a lot of cars coming up, going on to Lake Street. That's where it starts going from one lane to two lanes. That's where all the congestion is. If you put a, the bus there, you're going to cut a lot of that traffic, a lot of that. There's also the Fox Library there. There are kids Wednesday nights going in there. We have to have more answers, more of a picture of how it's going to work because as a business we don't want to take the parking space there's not enough parking space to begin with and we don't want to take the residents parking spaces as well from Cleveland Street so there must be something that to do at that p moment there <laughs> go ahead Adam Sorry, the, you were the, the first at question me. was it, the, the pilot is not running on the other okay. side. The the east. The pilot is well, not. I wanted yeah, to, like, make, not I want to make sure there would be no cha nothing yeah, changing with the on that side. I That's don't great. know. Will it take the parking spaces from there once the bus? No, uh, the, the plan is not to look at the westbound lane. That's how the okay, so that that's not. okay. But when it starts working, will it go uh -huh. into taking well, that, the bus, the parking spaces away for the pilot? That's not the plan. Okay. So, and but we, again, we will be investigating this and evaluating the mm -hmm. entire street and the roadway and all the conditions. And so we will be looking at what's happening in the westbound lane and how it's being utilized. That's part of it, but that is not the plan at the moment. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. I just want to make sure that there's enough parking spaces for our customers because we're a business. Cobratas, I, I mean, uh, we have a copy shop next door. We have all these. Right. We need to keep the businesses. There's a lot of four leases right now in East Arlington. So we, we don't need we that. We did undergo a parking, <laughs> preliminary parking observation study, so we at least have a sense of what does it look like in the morning between these hours, what are the trends, who's coming and going, and where is there double parking, what is the occupancy, uh, how long are the cars there, so that just I'll, know that we I'll take this into consideration. Yeah. I go in at 8 o'clock, 8.30, and there's nothing right on Cleveland Street, Lake Street. It's empty. <laughs> You, I'm sure you've seen it. I've seen you, you walk around there. It's empty. I don't know why there's a lot of commotion there. The, com the, the time when it's busy, it's from Cleveland Street going into Lake Street. That's where they come out. And then when they try to take a left turn onto Mass Ave, that's where there's uh, accidents and everything happening. That's what I'm concerned. If there's a bus going this way and they have the right of way, what's going to happen there? We have enough accidents as it is right there. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank we'll, you. we'll take a look at all of those things as part of the scenario development and including those impacts. Yes. Hi, uh, I'm Shelley Dean. I live in, uh, actually on Cleveland Street in East Arlington. Um, I've lived in East Arlington, not necessarily in that location for 35 years. I used to be a very enthusiastic 77 bus rider. Um, I, um, I, I'm not an enthusiastic bus rider anymore. Um, but I have a couple questions, a couple comments. Um, one is a question. I, um, may I just ask, at the time we're at, if you can use a yeah. little brevity, please. So um, th there's, on Lake Street at the bike lane, there's been talk about installing a traffic signal 
um, which, with the idea that that will help speed um, uh, folks on Lake Street and getting off of Mass Ave. And I'm wondering if you can just mention the timing of, of that project compared to this, because I think that will also just help Mass Ave tra uh, traffic. So we did not uh, receive the Complete Street State Grant to implement that um, that traffic signal at the uh, intersection of the uh, Lake Street and the bikeway. So we're now back to the drawing board of uh, whether or not we apply for a future grant round or apply for capital planning funding for next year. So this pilot will be happening well before we have any implementation for that project. Okay, right. that's unfortunate, but good to know. Um, the second question or comment is that it's my perception that not all of the buses that are scheduled to run on, on the 77 line actually get run, that a bunch of them get pulled. And also certainly the problem of bunching at both at the start and the stop. I mean, you know, three buses leave Harvard Square at, at you know, within moments of each other. Um, and so I'm wondering if it's in fact correct that 77 buses are taken off the route, which help um, contribute to buses being crowded, buses being slow, sort of all of that, and um, whether um, since mo most buses that I take now are, are crowded, is the idea that ultimately the goal will be that, that the T will run more buses on the 77 line? Yeah, so, so I'm going to let Wes answer. Yeah, so let me answer. There's a couple things to that. So we, have, we do have challenges at times when we don't have enough drivers to drive all of our buses. And so what happens is we'll have what we call a dropped trip. So we'll have... We have enough buses, we don't have enough drivers. We normally would meet the schedule, we just don't have enough drivers that day. So then sometimes we end up having to pull a driver and say, you were gonna go on the 77, but we have more demand in a different route or, or something to that effect, so we have to say, go over here instead. It's a dispatching challenge for us. That's actually something we're looking and evaluating as, again, part of the Better Bus Project, which I encourage everyone to go to our website. Um, but we're looking at that as well. I will say, though, our board for this next fiscal year are hiring 55 more drivers. They're not actually adding new service, but they're trying to deal with that issue of dropped trips, trying to backfill for where we're seeing those gaps in the system so we can try to get to that point that we're not dropping those trips anymore. And, of course, a drop trip, I think, impacts a lot of people on a lot of levels, especially when you're relying on a bus to come. Okay. So we, we actually have, we're at our time, I, and I, I, if you... I'd Can I make one other very quick comment? Which is just that I really, su I really support the idea of express buses that maybe only have two or three stops in Arlington and Porter Square and Harvard Square. And I think it'll take a tremendous number of people off, off the buses more quickly. I also encourage you to go to the Better Bus website and comment. That'd be great. <laughs> Do you, can we have time for one more question? We've got a, we've got a couple comments and a question. <laughs> Hi, I'll try to be quick. Uh, Andrew Freeman uh, on Kimball Road. Uh, it's the 350 line. Um, my wife and I and our two small children are year-round bike commuters. If you show the slide showing 50% on time performance for a 350, you'll know why. Um, I'm a believer in BRT, uh, so I'm kind of concerned about evaluating the data here. Uh, my observations of how the 350 runs are that it, they pull drivers of the buses from other routes. So I don't think when evaluating the data that this is going to help the 350. So keep that in mind. Uh, the other thing is reconfiguring the street using cones and whatever. There's, we, we've talked about challenges, the, the, the bump outs, the bike lanes, and so on. What's the approach uh, to balancing uh, the, the, the different users on the road? Right. How are you going to approach your proposal? So, Ralph, maybe. Yeah, and, and I think you're correctly identifying one of the key challenges here, and that's, you know, the town's engaged a design consultant to help do this. Our job as the advisors here is to help bring the best and most thoughtful and, you know, examples from around the country and around the world to how this can happen and to help push to make that balance as, as great as possible. You know, I think there's lots of ideas that have been talked about in the presentations and here and in their application that we're going to do our best to help the town implement. Okay. And again, I think the, the beauty of this whole program is it's meant to pilot it, right? So we are going to learn from what happens here. 
We're learning from what happened in Everett. We're learning from what happened in Boston. We're going to learn from what happens in Cambridge in terms of how those things can work and how you're supposed to sign it and how many cones you need and how you're going to enforce it and, and then how do we measure each of those things. So, okay. you know, I think you're correctly identifying exactly what those challenges are that, you know, you don't need these kinds of improvements except in places where you're already having these sorts of issues. Right. right, so that, that, that's what we're trying to get at. Right. I think I just might add too quickly, you know, we know a lot of people travel in a lot of different ways, and I think it's for us up to us and work with the city to figure out how we appropriately balance that and take that into account. We, we do end up on the 350, but usually something has already gone wrong for that point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to say thank you to everybody for coming out this evening, and particularly to Julia, to Ralph, to Wes, and to Adam for your remarks this evening. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for your participation. Good night.